Hello everyone, welcome to part three of my video series on my 30 pound featherweight combat robot crippling depression. I've already covered the overview in part one. In part two, I talked about the electronics and now it's time to talk about one of my favorite aspects of this robot, the drive system. As I mentioned in part one of this series, the drive system was the very first thing that I designed for this robot and everything else kind of came later and was actually reliant on that. So I started with designing these drive pods, testing them out, and ultimately what I wanted to do was test out the motor, test out brushless drive, test out the firmware settings, and also test out like the difference between a chain drive or a pulley driven system, and ultimately just kind of figure out what kind of speed I wanted, how much power I needed, and everything else. Once that was figured out, the whole rest of the chassis and the design for the robot was built around that, so much so that the weapon disc actually was one of the last things that I designed, and it was designed to fit directly in between the two front wheels after all the drive system and the chassis was built around it. So really the core of this robot is these two drive pods. When I first started designing Crippling Depression, I knew that I had a lot of requirements for the drive system. First and foremost, I knew I wanted to have four wheels instead of two wheels. Four wheels tend to drive straighter than a two-wheel drive system, and they tend to be a lot more maneuverable. So I wanted to have a robot that was extremely maneuverable. In addition to that, I wanted it to also be extremely fast. This is definitely overkill for the arena sizes that I'm in because it goes at like 15, 16 miles per hour tops, which is way too fast. In theory, I can do one side of the arena to the other side in like a second, you know, somewhere around a second. So it's actually really, really quick. I actually had to dial everything back in the software to make it a lot slower. In addition to that, I also wanted a relatively low center of gravity. So the center of gravity in this robot is extremely low, and I also wanted even weight distribution. So the weight distribution in this is just behind these front wheels in the dead center. So that also helps with traction. The other thing that I wanted for this robot is invertibility. I want it to be able to drive normally and also upside down just fine, which actually happened in the competition. And it was really nice that it was able to drive upside down. And lastly, I wanted the whole drive system to be basically shock mounted and isolated from any hits to the chassis. And so that's why the UHMW pods house all of the drive components and they're kind of isolated from the rest of the chassis. So I don't have to worry about a big hit into the chassis going directly into the motor and shattering things out. Of course that can still happen, but this is slightly more isolated than if I had everything bolted directly to the aluminum frame. The design for the drive pods themselves came out of a couple different factors. One of the main factors was basically the travel of my mill. The internal frame rails, um, here's a couple early prototypes of them. This is about the maximum X travel that I have on my Tormach CNC machine. And so the drive pods are actually that same length since they sit right next to it. And so I didn't really want to go any bigger than that. So what I wanted to do is I knew that I was going to be using these bands bot wheels. Um, for many reasons, the height of these wheels allowed me to fit the motor, the chassis and the bearings, and then the actual weapon underneath of it. So I knew that this height was going to work with, you know, about a sixteenth of an inch to spare top and bottom. So I designed the pods basically around these wheels and the distance of travel that I had on my machine. And you can see there's very little on either side of these. I can't really move them out any further and I really can't move them in any further. So this ultimately dictated the size of the pods. Once I figured out the rough form factor of everything, I needed to choose the motor and the gearbox. I knew I was going to be using a Bainbots P60 gearbox since that was a common gearbox used in most of the weight classes in the you know, 30 to 60 pound size. So I knew that was going to happen. I just needed to pick the right gearbox ratio and the right motor. Once I started looking at motors, I kind of you know landed on the right KV rating. For anyone not familiar, a KV rating is essentially how fast a motor will move given a certain voltage. So let's say you have a motor that 
that has a 1000 kV rating and you feed it 10 volts, 10 times the kV rating of 1000 gives you 10,000 RPM. So if you run that into a 10 to 1 gearbox to make this really easy, you have a 1000 RPM and then you can simply calculate the circumference of your wheel and you know that one revolution is going to take you that far and then you can ultimately use that to calculate your top speed or your top speed in miles per hour or whatever that is. So I basically had a target of between 12 and 15 miles an hour and I picked the right combination of gearbox and motor that would give me that speed. Once I got all the parts figured out and I knew that I was going to be using the Bainbots gearboxes, I knew I was going to be using the um, 3 and 7 8 inch wheels, and I knew I was going to be using the um, 4238 750 kV motors, it was time to just kind of bolt everything together and start testing things out. As I mentioned in my previous video on electronics, I was using an 80 amp ESC. Now I ended up with that ESC for a number of different reasons. First off, it was one that I could reprogram with Simon K firmware, which was necessary to get the forward and backwards drive. The second reason I used that was because I initially did some testing with a 50 amp and a 60 amp. I very quickly blew up the 50 amp and um, I not so quickly blew up the 60 amp, but I eventually blew up the 60 amp. And um, doing some tests with the telemetry, I actually found out that I was drawing about 55 amps peak under hard acceleration with everything maxed out. So I found out that like 50 was about the limit that the motor would take. And so I ended up going about 80 on the ESC. And um, if you saw my previous video on how to reprogram the ESCs, go ahead and check that out. That goes into all the details on how I reprogrammed the ESC to accept the Simon K firmware so that I could start tweaking those settings and getting the drive set up. I'm not going to really go into the actual settings in this video because I found that they're extremely dependent on the combination of the motor and the ESC that you have. Case in point, I was um, dealing with um, Pete who built uh, 60 seconds to glory and he actually shared his settings with me and we had a very similar drive setup and within like a minute it blew up both of my ESCs. I made a couple small changes and it worked for me. So my settings very well might not work for you and your combination. I'm going to do a separate video maybe further down the road that explains how to kind of tweak these settings and getting it working right for you. Um, after I got all that figured out, it was just a matter of kind of physically prototyping everything out. I prototyped everything out of wood. I have all the um, early generations of the drives, and I even have an early, I hesitate calling this a chassis, but just kind of a rudimentary chassis that was roughly the same size as what crippling depression was going to be. And I actually did two full chassis. The very first one was just basically a piece of plywood that I just kind of bolted the gearboxes to, and it had... Um, this, these dead axles in front. It was basically just a hole drilled into a block of wood with a half inch shaft running through it and it just kind of rubbed and that was the very, very, very first test. And that was mostly just to test the ESCs, the radio, and just kind of the brushless drive in general. And then once I kind of figured out that, you know, that roughly worked, then I moved over to this beautiful thing and actually built the um, drive boxes, put those together, bolted those inside of this little kind of chassis and then figured out how that was going to work. So I did a lot of prototyping. So now that that's kind of out of the way, let's get this on the workbench, take a closer look and then disassemble these and see what the drive pods actually look like. Here is yet again another look inside of Crippling Depression. I've got the um, two motors and gearboxes here and then the drive pods sit there. Before I disassemble the actual drive pods and take them out, I wanted to point out a couple little things inside of here. Uh, these little um, drive cups right here are basically just uh, pieces of PLA that have been 3D printed and they're here for a couple different reasons. One, they are just here to kind of um, isolate the wires and keep everything out from this side. This right here actually um, rests up against the top armor, so that actually sits flush. So when this is in place, nothing can really get into this side. The only things that can get in are this side, and that's where the drive ESCs are held. So it just kind of helps isolate the wires a little bit. The second purpose to these is actually some mounting points. There's mounting points here, here. Um, this is where the radio mounts, and then you have these little mounts back here, and that's where the fans mount. So they're just kind of little um, attachment points, and they actually screw in underneath on the underside into the um, gearbox on the other side right there. Another thing that I wanted to point out that you might be able to see here is the little spacer. 
When I first started doing these gearboxes, the um, 4238 motor is not made up directly with the gearbox. The shaft is a little bit too long, so you kind of need an adapter plate. So I made these little adapter plates, um, one there and one there, out of ABS. I basically just laser cut these on my laser cutter and just kind of went together like that. As you can see, the motors ended up getting very loose after combat and there's a couple reasons for that one abs does not hold a thread very well so the threads kind of loosened up and two i didn't do as much loctite or thread locking as i should have so i'm gonna have to do something a little bit different the reason i didn't cut the shaft shorter is for a number of different reasons but you have to completely disassemble the motor i mean i guess you can cut the shaft without that but i just didn't really want to mess with that i actually like the adapter better so i might just make one of these out of aluminum Although you could just cut the shaft shorter and compress everything and that would work. But I actually just kind of like having um, this adapter plate. I actually really don't like the adapter plate on the Bainbots. It has way too much play in it. And this actually has a lot less play when it's actually all tightened up. And here's a closer look at one of these um, eh, drive pod things. I don't know what I'm calling it. Um, but yeah, it's just a um, 3D printed piece of PLA. And you can see the motor just kind of um, sits nicely in there. The gearbox is there. And um, here is your mounting for the gearbox from the underside. So yeah, pretty simple. So um, let's um, take the weapon off, take the armor off, and just start disassembling it to remove the drive pods. First off, I am sorry for the next couple of shots being out of focus. I moved the tripod a little bit higher to get a wider field of view and I forgot to change the focus settings. And unfortunately, I really only want to do this once with the disassembly, so I'm going to keep the footage. Here is the look inside underneath the armor. Um, I had to take off the weapon to get the armor plates off and I wanted to do that just to show you kind of these pods. The other thing I wanted to do was actually take these off because there's a lot of rubbing. And I actually suspect it's these because they're all kind of broken up. So I wanted to take these off and see if the rubbing is being caused by these. So interestingly enough, the only thing holding this motor on was actually the drive pod, which is funny because it still drives just fine. You can see a big crack down the side. So I'm going to have to do something different with these adapter plates. It looks like the um, screws just threaded right out. So I'll probably just make that out of aluminum or something. So I'm going to set this aside. And then this one is free. Yeah, so that's much nicer. There is a tremendous amount of debris inside of here and it's not from the um, weapon system it's it looks like um, one of these just got completely chewed up and it was just a bunch of this stuff everywhere so that's interesting this is actually the very first time i've opened this up since the competition so the next thing i'm going to do is you got to take off these side plates to pull um, the whole drive block out and i'm going to try and do this one since the motor is already out from it and yeah, awesome. Um, on this side, one of the Allen screws actually got smashed up, so I'm going to have to grind that out. But on this side, everything looks good, so I'm going to go take this whole assembly out. You can see long screws that go basically the whole length that go into this. And there we go, one of the drive blocks free and everything feels great on this. There's a bit of debris in that um, gearbox, but other than that, looks fine. Not bad. If you watched my assembly video, you probably saw how all of this went together, so I'm not really going to be adding that much new. But what I did want to show is how this all fared after the combat, because this piece has not been touched or opened up since the assembly video, and it went through all the fights and the rumble. So I just kind of want to open this up and see if there's any changes I need to make or any improvements. And so it just takes this one screw on the outside. And this whole top should come off. 
Wow, that looks fantastic. I got no issues with that whatsoever. So let me just kind of give you a couple little explanations of what's going on in here. Um, we've got the two bearings that actually press fit into this UHMW block. And fun fact, these um, two little holes right there are for eighth inch pins. So you can press out the bearings if there's any damage to the bearings. So that was kind of a little last minute feature. And everything else here is just kind of weight savings. And then if we look over at this um, main block, you can see right here there is a channel for the chain. So the chain really can't go anywhere. It can only go inside of there. And I see the slightest bit of rubbing, really not much. Uh, UHMW is actually a good slippery material that's used for bearings and you know moving mating surfaces. So it actually works well with this chain. And the reason the chain is so loose right now is because it's not being held um, by the two bearings. When it's actually held in place, um, it actually gets a lot more taut like that. And um, the other thing that I didn't mention in the video is these, these little um, gear sprockets here. The gear sprockets are actually actobotics. I actually looked around quite a bit for some sprockets that would work. And fortunately, with this gearbox, I need it to be relatively thin. This is about as thin as you can get, being that there's a bearing here, there's the chain, the actual hub for the wheel here, and then another bearing. So when you really do a transparent view in SOLIDWORKS and look at this, there is no wasted space in here at all. So I needed the gear to be basically the, or the sprocket to be the width of the chain, plus a little bit extra and plus a little bit extra just so it didn't rub. And I couldn't find anything. They all had these huge clamp hubs on the end of it. Can't really find one of my old ones, but they just were really big and bulky and had a set screw. These are all just keyed, and I actually stacked a spacer on top of a sprocket on top of a spacer, and it looks like they actually fared quite well. So yeah, I don't think I'm gonna really do anything to change these drive blocks. I'm probably just gonna reassemble this and use it on the next version of the robot. So that's pretty cool. Overall, I am very happy with the performance of these drive modules. They lasted just great. I didn't have to go in there and service anything, which is always a plus. I'm gonna make a couple minor modifications for the next iteration, uh, mainly a better way for these motors to attach on there. I have a couple different options and I'll test out a couple different things, but overall, very happy with it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea of the drive system behind crippling depression. Be sure to check out the last and final video of this series, which will be discussing the weapon system. And you can also go back and watch the other videos and also watch the assembly videos for more information. You can also check out my Facebook page for more you know, details and updates about all my projects. And also check out my Patreon page to see the channels that I support. And also go ahead and support my channel if you want. Thanks for watching and see you next time.